a happy new year. You know, I heard this joke that 2022 sounds a lot like 2022, which is really scary because who wants to live through that again? So my prayer for you this year is that you would rather see it as an opportunity for God to build and bring restoration to your life. So let us make this year a year of building and restoration. Church, our prayer is that Jesus would lead the pace of your life. Mm. Let him lead you in everything you do this year. We are so excited. We look forward to the year. We can't wait to see what God will do with new opportunities. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Let us build together. And remember, we love you. We love you. Happy New Year. Have a blessed year.
us, Jesus. Your spirit lives in us, oh Lord. Yeah. You empower us, Lord. You empower us, Jesus. It's only by your spirit. It's only by your spirit, Lord. We look to you, Jesus. bridge again and now when we sing it we're going to sing it with a conviction understanding that the spirit of the Lord lives in us that is the freedom that Jesus died for on the cross that we like we don't have to go to a high priest who will intercede on our behalf but we have God in us we can we can talk to and actually commune with so he is with you in this moment and we're going to declare that out he is alive in you the Holy Spirit is inside of you all the authority that has been given to Jesus it's in Jesus' name so we can speak it Amen, church. And God is alive in me. The Holy Spirit is out of me. Yes. And all the authority in Jesus' name. God is alive in me. And the Holy Spirit is out of me. And all the authority in Jesus' name. Come on. God is alive in me, and Holy Spirit inside of me. Yes. Come on, church, sing it with the conviction in your heart. In Jesus' name, God is alive in me, Holy Spirit inside of me, and all the authority. In Jesus' name, by the power of your Spirit. Strongholds will break, oh, we can feel it. As we lift you high, we come alive. We hear the sound of revival, revival breaking out. By the power of your spirit, it's only by your spirit, by the power. Hey, what an amazing, amazing time of worship. Church, that is one of the most important things, is worshiping together, whether in person or online. I know this is an online service, but worship is always powerful just because of the fact that you and I can get to declare who God is. Fantastic. Now, if this is your first time with us, I want to say a special welcome to you. We would love for you to give us a shout out. So in the comment section, just give us a shout out. Say, hey, I'm watching from this place and it's my first time and we're just going to give you a massive, massive shout out online. Our team is waiting and ready to welcome you. A couple of things you need to know that in the description of this video will be a little bit more information as to who we are. So click it, fill in the digital connect card, get in touch with us. See our WhatsApp number. If there's anything you need from us, drop us a WhatsApp and we will respond as soon as we can. Then you also need to know that we kick off our in-person services next week, Sunday. And so this is only online for today. Next week, we're back in the building, 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. We look forward to celebrating the new year with you. And when you invite someone, please do let them know that we do lock the gates 10 minutes after the service start, purely just for safety reasons, because we've got kids on the premises and we value their safety. We wanna make sure that everything goes smoothly. And now for the giving segment of the service. Firstly, I wanna say church, a massive thank you to you. For those of you who don't know, we decided that on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we would give all the money we received over that weekend away to bless others. And if you remember, the theme for last year was others. And so we just felt that it was important for us to be generous and exercise generosity. And we just gave it all away. We blessed two beneficiaries with the income we received. And that is simply because of you. And so here's my encouragement to you today. Galatians 6 
verse 9. You know this verse, we read it all the time and it's a good reminder for you and I. If you are new to the Christian faith, this is an important verse for you to remember. It says, so let us not get tired of doing what is good. You know what? This year, we are not going to get tired and we are not going to go weary of doing good, of blessing others and of being generous. Why? Because at just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. If we want to attract the blessing of God, God's hand of blessing and favor, you know what it starts with? It starts with our generosity. As we are generous unto others, God will continue to pour out His generosity upon us. And so, this year we want to bless more people. We want to give out more food packs. We want to be more generous, especially to our community of faith. And that's the very next part of the verse. Therefore, whenever you have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. We want to continue extending generosity to our church family. We want to continue making church for others. We want to continue making church exciting for others. We're going to continue working on our cafe and making it a warm and friendly place. We're going to continue handing out food packs and blessing others in and around our church. We're going to continue handing out what we can, where we can, unto others so that we can continue being a church that is generous. Why? Because you make this possible. And so church, as you give today, firstly, thank you. Secondly, do not grow weary. Continue to give, continue to serve, continue to be generous because that's how we cultivate unity and hope in our community. With that being said, let me pray for us and you will see the ways to give on the screen. Father God, we thank you that we can be generous this year. Why? Because you were generous unto us. And so may we continue carrying your heart, your heart for others, your heart for those who are in desperate need, your heart for the church community. May we continue being generous as you continue to pour out your generosity upon us. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, hello! We are at the start of a brand new year. Welcome to United Church. Um, it's going to be an amazing service today. Obviously, like you can see, things are looking a little bit different. We are online only. But nonetheless, we're going to have a great time. Firstly, I want to say a massive Happy New Year, like you heard me and Shani say earlier. We hope that this would be a year of blessing, of favor, and of growth. And so before we get into it, let me pray a prayer of blessing over you. God, today we come before you thanking you for another year, thanking you for another season, another opportunity where we can step into your fullness, into all that you have for us. And so God, may this year be a year of blessing. I pray for every person watching this. May you have your hand upon them. I pray for your favor upon them. I pray for more of your grace and your mercy upon their lives. But here's my biggest prayer, God, that we would grow deeper into your presence that we would be led by and guided by your presence, that this would be a year where we discover more of you. May we look back at past faithfulness and recognize your consistency in our lives, recognize that you've been there and you have been faithful. And may that give us even deeper trust to look forward to what you have for us, to trust you more, to grow and to build lives on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ. And so God, this year, May this be a year of building strong, building strong foundations, building strong families, strong careers, strong everything that we are setting out to build. May it be strong. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, when it comes to the start of the year, it's always a difficult thing deciding what to speak on because there's so many things. So many people have resolutions. So many people have made plans. Like I said, you've got hopes and you've got dreams and things are just all over the place. But today, I really want to start a message that I begin will, that I believe will set the tone for where we are to go. 
And if you can just apply the principles that we'll speak about today, this will set you up for the plans that you are making. Whatever plans you are making in your own life, whether you are setting new goals, whether you are moving forward in goals you've already started and just progressing in them, whether you're deciding to build a family or a career or studies or stronger relationships, whatever it is, my prayer is that what we learn today will help you and benefit you as you begin to build. And so the title of today's message is Rules to Live By. Rules to Live By. And I know what you're going to say. Rules don't have a good connotation in our culture. Let's be honest. Many people don't live by rules. Many people don't like rules. We don't respond well to rules. And so I'll explain what I mean by rules. This is not the traditional rule that you might be thinking of. And so let's kick it off in John chapter 10 verse 10 says this, the thief The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now think about that word, a rich and satisfying life. I read this verse a lot because that always fascinates me. What does a rich and satisfying life look like? It's not about getting more things. It's simply just about living in fullness. Well, have a a look at a different version in the Amplified. It says this, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you may have life and have it in abundance, in brackets, to the full until it overflows. Oof, I love that. Until it overflows. If you were to look over your life at this moment, would you describe it as a life that is overflowing? Or would you say it's simply just a life that you are enduring? See, the goal is to move toward a place where life is overflowing. And like I said, not material possessions or more stuff, but simply overflowing in God's goodness that we may pour into others and be a blessing unto others. And this is why I want to speak about the title of the sermon being Rules to Live By. Rules to Live By. Now, I know that rules are not a good thing in our society, um, It's not a good connotation. Some people don't like living by rules. And so let me explain what I mean when I say rules to live by. Another word for the word rule is simply something like a trellis. It's something that they put in gardens. If you've ever seen gardens, especially where tomatoes grow, where you put something in the ground where you kind of help guide the plants to grow up. For an example, if you look over here, I've got this beautiful lollipop tree. Mm, It smells amazing. I love it. And so if you look down at the stem, you would notice that there's a little stick that holds it up. It is. It helps the tree grow upright and it gives the stem stability so that it can sustain the plant. That is what I mean when I say a rule. It is a way or pattern to which you model your life that gives you stability and that gives you grounding. Another way of looking at it is when you go into a vineyard. I've got a picture of this beautiful vineyard. If you look at how grapes grow, they grow along these trellises. They grow all the way up. And obviously when it's small, you put lower trellises. But as it begins to grow higher, your trellises go higher in order to sustain the vine. It gives the vine stability. It helps the vine grow. So here's the thing. When we say rule, I know that can sound like a limiting concept to some people. But really, it's meant to be a guide that helps you grow upward and that forms a support structure that can help you bear fruit. That's what I mean when I say rules to love by. Support structures, systems, trellises to build your life upon. And here's the thing, church. We need these. We need support systems. We need structure. We need these acts to help guide us, to give us upward movement, and to give us support. Why? Because we want to build strong lives. We want to build strong lives, we want to build strong families, we want to build a strong faith, we want to build strong careers, we want to build strong relationships, and these things help us do just that. I love what Margaret Gunther said when it comes to building a rule of life. This is what she said. A good rule can set us free to be our true and best selves. It is a working document, a kind of spiritual budget. Not carved in stone, but subject to regular review and revision. It should support us, but never constrict us. That's what I want to focus on. It should support us, but not constrict us. That is what it means to build a good rule of life. Something that will support you, that will bring freedom, that will bring growth, but not something that is limiting. And so this morning, I just want to caution us to not build structures that are more limiting but structures that are more freeing. 
Now, let's just be clear. How are these things different from New Year's resolutions or goals? Because you need, we need to understand these are not resolutions. These are not goals. These are not tasks to be ticked off. And that's the thing. A rule of life is different to goals and intentions and, revol- and resolutions that we set for ourselves because those things are all task-based. They are measurable. You can go back, tick it off a box, mark it as done. Whereas a rule of life is a pattern of life. It's a habit. You can't really tick it off because it's never done. It is something that you live by. And so a rule of life helps you become. See, tasks help you do, right? Tasks and resolutions, you set out to do things, to accomplish things, whereas a rule of life is more focused on helping you become. Becoming the person that you are growing into, becoming the person that patterns your life after God, becoming the person that God wants you to be. The rule of life helps you become. It is comprised of several simple statements that guide the posture of your life. And so it's not a rule book. It it is statements that help guide your life, that help posture your life so that you can grow. And the living of your days, days, it is... Um, It is not lived perfectly, but can be lived faithfully while fostering within us an integrated and embodied life of faith. When you and I live by a rule of life, we move from fast and fleeting to deep and stable. We need to move from fast and fleeting, where life is fast-paced and we're just barely touching on things, to deep and stable where our roots grow deep or our foundations grow deep and we have stability. See, many people struggle with this because life is so fast-paced and fleeting, they can never grow deep roots. And here's what I will caution us with. Firstly, be careful that these rules, these rules of life, these patterns or these habits should lead us to a more healthy and holistic way of life. Be careful this is not, that this is not just stuff that we do, boxes, to tick, because if the moment it becomes that, we lose perspective. Secondly, these rules, you and I need to commit to the long-term process. This is not something that's just going to happen in a month or two. It's going to require um, intentional checking in over and over and over again. And if we commit to the long-term process, then every time we go off track, we just come back on track. That's the beautiful thing about this. It's not a list, it's not a uh, box to tick, it's not a list to go through, it's a pattern of life. And finally, these rules aren't meant to earn points with God. You've already got your salvation. You're not working towards that. So you're not working to impress God. These things aren't going to impress God. God is already impressed with you. He already loves you. Um, You are already his child. These rules simply help us work towards becoming more like Jesus. Because here's the thing, a beautiful, sanctified, and holistic life doesn't just fall into your lap, like I said. We need to work towards it. We need to move towards it. So, here's what you've been waiting for. What are these rules? I'm just going to give you four. There are so many. And some of the early church fathers um, really did such a good job at unpacking some of these, you know. And, and, And there are so many books and articles and all sorts of things written about establishing a good rule of life. But let me just speak about four of them that'll help you and I today. And you probably know all of these. And so whether or not you know them, the emphasis is to remind you and then for you to apply them consistently. So here's the first one. The first rule to live by is the practice of deep-centered prayer. The practice of deep-centered prayer. Now, as Christians, you and I know that prayer is important. I mean, you should know this. If you are new to Christianity, well, there you have it. Prayer is vitally important to the Christian life and to the Christian faith. But see, the difference for many people is that prayer is simply an add-on to an already busy life. Think about it. This might be you. I know this has been me at times. Where I just live my life at a fast pace and I just kind of tag pray on every now and again because I'm like, oh wait, I should be doing this. I feel guilty that I'm not doing it. But really, prayer is meant to be the center. It's meant to be the integrated part of my life. And so prayer needs to be integral and personal and um, consistent in our lives. And so we often treat it like a task. You know, you kind of, 
wake up, you go about your day. At some point you realize, oh, I haven't prayed today. And then you kind of just slip on in there. No, no, no. That shouldn't be what it's like. You and I need to see prayer as something that helps us become. Prayer helps us become more like Jesus. And so a reminder to you is not to make prayer as something to be ticked off a list, but something to be practiced and lived by. Have a look at what Jesus says in John chapter 15. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And so from this, we recognize that to remain in Jesus, we need to have communion with him. We need to um, spend time with him. And prayer is the foundation to that. Prayer helps us spend time with him. The only way to become like Jesus is to spend time with Jesus. And prayer helps us do that. Have a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. Unceasing and persistent. I mean, think about that. That means simply just continuing with prayer as a pattern of life. It's not just something you do at one point in the day. Recognize that prayer is an ongoing conversation with God. I love Psalm 119. Verse 147, it says, I rise early before the sun is up and I cry out for help and put my hope in your words. That's a good model for prayer. When you wake up in the morning, let it be the first thing you do and then continue the conversation throughout the day. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a belief statement that can form the rule to live by. Are you ready for this? This is the first one. And this is what it says. I will live a life of deep centered prayer as I draw near to God and become more like Jesus. Don't you think that's a good rule to live by? A good standard, a good pattern, a good habit to form in your life? Living a life of deep centered prayer. When I say deep centered, what I mean by that, it's not fleeting words that just come out just because we kind of feel guilty. No, no, no. I mean prayers that connect our heart to God's heart. Prayers that stem from the inner depths of who we are. Prayers that that God answers, that God sees. Prayers that formulate our deepest desires. That's what I mean when I say deep-centered prayer. I hope this is helpful so far. Let's go on to the second one. This is not going to be long. I've got three more after, or two more after this. But I hope this is helpful so far. The second rule to live by is the practice of of Sabbath rest. Wait, before you log off, hang on, hang on, don't go anywhere. I know some of you, when you hear the word Sabbath, it's like a swear word. Because for those of you, especially if you are predominantly productive and you're a doer, the thought of a Sabbath rest is something so foreign to you because you can't sit still. I know I'm one of those people. Sitting still sounds weird, but that's because we have the wrong idea of what Sabbath is. So let me unpack just a short bit of what Sabbath is. Sabbath Sabbath rest is the deliberate stopping for the purpose of focusing on the beauty and enjoyment of God. The deliberate stopping. Stopping from what? Stopping from a fast pace. Stopping from the hustle and bustle. Stopping from this unproductive, never-ending cycle of work. To To be reminded of the beauty of God and to enjoy God's creation. Sabbath stands in direct contrast to this hustle and grind culture. And I know so many people kind of live by that. It's always hustle. It's always grind. It's always go, go, go. We need to build. We need to move. Never stopping. Never slowing down. But see, that's so contrary to how God works. Because in the beginning of creation, we see that God worked hard to create the world by his words. He formed beauty out of chaos. But then he rested. He took time to enjoy creation. See, you and I can get so busy building a life that we forget to stop and take it all in. Sabbath rest is about taking in the beauty of the creation of God. We need to understand this. Sabbath isn't just an instruction or not instruction. Sabbath isn't just a suggestion. Sabbath is a spiritual principle, right? It is a rule to live by. It helps you and I find grounding, find stability in our lives. So Sabbath is a spiritual principle principle, not just a suggestion. Now here's a, uh, the problem many people have. is like, What do you do on a Sabbath? Do I just sit and do nothing? I can't do that. 
I can't do that either. Don't worry, we're in the same boat. See, on a Sabbath, we are meant to engage in restful, fulfilling, and nurturing activity that helps us focus on God. I don't know if you've ever seen it that way. That's what it's meant for. It's, helped you, it's meant to help you focus on being restful, on doing fulfilling and nurturing activity that helps you focus on God. So for many people, it could be many different things. For some people who enjoy gardening, and that's where they find rest and their soul is at peace, then garden, man. Plant your plants, prune your trees, do what you need to do. It's things like gardening, going for a walk, hiking, coffee or lunch with a close friend or some loved ones, Reading something that isn't work-related. Some people read for rest and recreation. Can you believe these people? I don't understand them either. Don't worry. But some people read for rest and recreation and relaxation. Their mind is at peace. Their soul is calm. Some people enjoy a good movie, obviously, something that is wholesome. You know, something that you can enjoy. Some people enjoy creating music. Their soul is at peace. Their mind is at ease. There's no rush and hurriness. There's no deadline towards it. These are things that help us Sabbath properly. Some people play instruments. I love doing photography. I love taking photos, spending time with my kids. There's no, there's no to-do list that needs to be ticked off. There's no deadline there. It's just something that you enjoy that helps you focus on God, that helps fulfill you and nurture you so that you can be reminded of God's beauty. And here's the thing, if we don't get this right, let me, let me tell you what's at stake. See, if we focus or if we honor the Sabbath, then we work from a place of rest. But if we don't honor the Sabbath, we are always trying to catch up on rest. Have you ever been stuck in that cycle? Well, you're always trying to catch up on rest. You never feel like you've rested well enough. You always feel like there's the next thing and the next thing and you just come from the weekend, you wish for another weekend. You just come from the holiday, you wish for another holiday. Ah! See, that's what happens when we don't honor the Sabbath. We're stuck in this never-ending loop of busyness, never taking time to relax and rest. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 says this, Remember the Sabbath, the seventh day, to keep it holy, set apart and dedicated to God. Notice, this is in Exodus chapter 20. This is part of the Ten Commandments. We honor all the others. We don't kill, we don't steal, you know, we don't lie, all of these other things. But Sabbath is the one that we forget the most because it's so contrary to our popular culture that we've kind of just sidelined it. Have a look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus speaks about how he is the source of rest. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace. And I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. Here's what I want you to remember. Jesus is the source of rest. Jesus is the true source of rest. See, if we aren't resting in Jesus, then all other forms of rest are only but temporary. We will just be tired all over again, busy all over again. But if our souls rest in Jesus, we work from a healthier place. And so here's a pattern that I'd like to recommend for you quickly. This is just a side note. I remember learning this a few years ago from a book by Andy Crouch. And um, I've never forgotten it. I've tried to make it a pattern for myself. Commit to resting one hour a day, one day a week, and one week a year. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Some of you are going to kill me. Some of you are like, we just don't have that kind of time. Pastor Randy, do you know the life I live? Do you know my boss? Do you know the business that I'm trying to run? I cannot do that. Let me give you the opposite. What's at stake? What's at stake if you don't do this? What's at stake when you don't form the right patterns of rest? Let me tell you what's at stake. Firstly, your internal world will crumble. Secondly, you run the risk of crumbling your family. And finally, you run the risk of wearing yourself out. See, life was never meant to be lived this busy, busy, busy rat race. So, Commit one hour a day. I'm going to do something that is fulfilling and nurturing. Put my phone away, pick up a book, pick up an instrument, do what I need to do that brings rest to my soul. Then one day a week from a Friday or a Thursday or a Saturday or a Sunday, whatever that looks like, I'm going to rest in God. If it means I spend my Sunday coming to church and being refreshed then going home, spending time with my family, doing what I need to do, but commit to doing it. And then the third one, one 
week, a year. Just a week. If you've got more than that, if you've got more leave than that, do that. But that's a pattern to live by. So here's the statement, the belief statement that I want you to remember. I will honor my Sabbath, choosing to make Jesus the source of my rest. I will honor my Sabbath, choosing to make Jesus the source of my rest. Is this helpful so far? I hope it is. I hope you are finding a sense of fulfillment. I hope this is helping you set the right patterns in your life. Number three, the practice of investing into life-giving relationships. This one's going to be a bit of a short one. I'm a bit strapped for time. But the practice of investing into life-giving relationships. See, here's the thing. Human beings weren't made to live in isolation. You know this. I know this. Whether you are introverted, extroverted, whatever it is, we know that we need life-giving relationships around us. We are relational beings. Why? Because we're made in the nature and the image of God. God is a relational God. And so no matter how much you try, you can try cut people out, shut people out. You can try build walls up. At the end of the day, you're only going to leave yourself starved for healthy, life-giving relationships. And I know many people have kind of put all boundaries up and stuff. And here's the reason why. It's not because relationships are the problem. It's that the relationships are not life-giving. So we need to spend some time re-evaluating which relationships are life-giving to us. And which relationships we are giving life to. That's maybe what we need to re-evaluate. See, healthy relationships add to our lives. And they serve as a catalyst for growth. Healthy relationships add to. I mean, you would probably immediately think of people who add to your life. Whenever you're with them, you just feel better. You feel blessed. They encourage you. They inspire you. They build you up. They make you better. That's a life-giving relationship. But the opposite is true. Life-sucking relationships stag- uh, stagnate your growth. They lead you on a downhill spiral and they do not add to your life. Some people go the extreme and they just cut them out. I think the better thing to do is maybe start by limiting them. And then eventually, if it's not helping, then cut those relationships off. So the goal for you and I is to move toward a like-minded people, people who are like-minded, people who will share in our vision and our passion. We might be completely different in personality and, you know, all sorts of other things. It doesn't mean that you need to link up with people who are exactly like you. No, no, no. I love people who disagree with me, who challenge my thinking, but I know that they are like-minded. They love God. They love his church. They love his people. Those are the three things that help form my relationships. They love God. They love his church. They love his people. If those three things are in place, we're going to have a great friendship, a great relationship. We're going to inspire each other to do better in all areas of life. So pick some people who are like-minded and who share your passion for God. um, And you'll start growing in that. And then start to invest into that. Spend more time with those people. Enjoy life with those people. And when you do that, you'll find yourself building life-giving relationships. So here's the the value or the belief statement. I will make room for life-giving relationships that foster spiritual growth. Each word there is very intentional. Let's look at that again. I will, number one, make room. See, because life-giving relationships don't just fall into your lap. You have to nurture them. You have to build them. You have to invest into them. So make room in your life for relationships. If you're one of those people saying, look, I just don't have time to meet with friends and things are busy. No, no, no. Make room. Make room. For the second one, life giving. I've already explained that one. They need to bring life. Either they bring life to you or you bring life to them, but there needs to be a mutual life giving element to it. Life giving relationships that foster spiritual growth. See, there's many relationships that are good and superficial and we get along and we've got chemistry, but do they foster spiritual growth? That's the question you need to ask. See, if they don't foster spiritual growth, then just start to limit time with that because it might be great, but I want relationships that will foster my spiritual growth. And then finally, the fourth rule to live by. Is this helpful so far? I hope that it is. We're about to wrap up the last one. The practice of healthy work patterns. Woo! Pastor Randy, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. We can't speak about work on the 2nd of January, 2022. Some of us are just getting over a hectic holiday. I know, I know. But here's the thing. We can't speak about this if we don't speak about this one, because this is important. See, work needs to have its rightful place in our lives. It needs to. 
Work isn't a bad thing. Work is not a curse. Contrary to what you might think, sometimes you might be thinking, you don't know my boss, he or she is a curse. Whew. Work can be fulfilling and life-giving if it has its rightful place in our lives. See, when we put things in the right place, they become meaningful and fulfilling. See, when done in a healthy way, work can become life-giving, rewarding, and fulfilling. But when done in an unhealthy way, work leads to greed and unhealthy ambition. We always want more. We can never get enough. Either we want more money or we want more success. We want more fame. We want more popularity. We want more accolades. And it just leads to unhealthy ambition. But if we foster healthy patterns of work, we keep everything else at bay. See, unfortunately, you and I, if we don't get this right, we end up sacrificing. We end up sacrificing so many things on the altar of work. And here's what happens. We start sacrificing our inner peace, our spiritual growth, our families, and our overall well-being. So that's what happens. So what you, you and I need to realize is that work existed right in the beginning in Genesis when God created human beings. He gave them work. Work only took on a different form after the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter 3. But before that, God gave Adam and Eve the garden to work, to tend to, to create beauty out of the chaos, to be stewards of his creation. See, what you also need to realize is that most of the parables of Jesus center around work, in Matthew, like especially Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 13, 24. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted seed in the field. What does that mean? The farmer went to work. There's farming, there's tending, there's watering, there's cultivating, there's work involved. Matthew 13, 33, Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like a yeast a woman used in making bread. Again, there's work, there's kneading the dough, there's preparing, there's waiting for it to rise. There is work involved. Number three, Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. What is there? There's fishing, there's work, there's preparation, there's mending your nets, there's casting your net, that's reeling it in. There is work involved. So Jesus is not against work, contrary to popular belief. Some people are like, I can't wait to get to heaven where I'm not going to work. Uh, Rethink that thought. Work is from God. I know that sounds like heresy. Believe it or not, it is true. But here's the thing. You and I need to, need to start shifting our perspective. We need to stop despising work. We need to stop despising it because here's the reason why. We will never build or grow in a place that we constantly criticize and despise. We'll never build anything of value. We'll never build anything that is long-lasting for as long as we criticize and despise it. God has given so many of us such good opportunities, but because we despise it, we never walk in it. But if we build healthy patterns of work, we can live a more healthy and holistic life. Sometimes it's not the work that's the problem. It's our perspective and our unhealthy patterns, our ambition, our, our overworking, our rat race, see, all of those things lead to us eventually despising what we do. See, what affects our passion and enjoyment of work is the demands and the pace of what we do. Sometimes it's our own ambition, let's be honest and admit it. Sometimes no one puts those expectations on us except us, okay? Sometimes it's outside of our control. Sometimes it's the people above us and we just need to draw tighter boundaries and we need to have some tough conversations. And I know it's not easy, but sometimes they need to be had and we might need to make some sacrifices where necessary. See, if the pace of work is done, the pace of your work, the pace of the, the rat race and the going fast, see, if the pace has done more harm than good to your spiritual growth, then you need to reevaluate. You need to reevaluate. Is this good for me? Is this helping me build holistic and healthy patterns? then we need to make healthier decisions. Here's the thing. The more demanding the type of work you're in, if, you, if you're in a high-paced, high-stressed work environment that causes you to be out a lot, maybe you're on standby a lot, maybe it's just a high-demanding job. See, the more demanding your work is, the stronger the first three elements need to be. 
the first three practices, prayer, Sabbath rest, and relationships. If those three are strong, they can help sustain a fast-paced, high-demanding job base. As long as we are consistent and intentional about it, we can make it work. See, there's nothing wrong with having ambition. Don't get me wrong. We need to be dreaming. We need to be building. We need to be moving forward. But it shouldn't cost our souls. For Jesus said, what good is it if a man gains the whole world but loses his soul? So here's the value statement, the belief statement. Are you ready for this one? I will put work in its rightful place in my life so that I can become, so that it can become fulfilling and meaningful. I will put work in its rightful place in my life so that it can become fulfilling and meaningful. I hope this is helpful to you. This is so good. This challenged me because even I had some, I had to work on some stuff this year. And this is just the stuff that I've been processing in my own life and what God has been saying to me. And I really hope this is helpful to you as well. See, living by a rule of life creates room for the Holy Spirit of God to inwardly transform us. Think about that. If you and I have a rule of life to work by, and for, these are just four of them. There are so many more that, that you can begin to practice and that you can put in place for yourself. And I'm going to unpack these as the year continues. But see, living by this rule of life, by these patterns and these habits, what they do is they make room for the Spirit of God to begin to move in us. Why? Because suddenly the Spirit has access into these areas of our lives. The Spirit helps you pray. The Spirit helps keep your Sabbath. The Spirit reminds you, if you pay attention to your inner world, the Holy Spirit of God will nudge you and lead you towards Sabbath rest. The Holy Spirit will help you realize that, hey, rather than waiting for that getaway right at the end of the year when you are completely depleted and, and spent out, maybe we can take pockets of rest throughout the year and replenish ourselves. See, the Holy Spirit will lead us in rich and healthy relationships where we are growing in maturity and in spirituality with God. And finally, the Holy Spirit will lead us in our work. Believe it or not, God is intricately involved in your work. It's not something separate from Him. Our faith isn't like faith and work. Faith, family, work. No, no, no. It's integrated. Our faith has an impact on our work, and our work has an impact on our faith. And if we are Spirit-led, remember that's one of our values, to be united and spiritual and invested and generational. If we are spiritual, be, mean, meaning being led by His Spirit, then He will lead us in our work, in the very thing we do that He's given us as a gift. That's the goal for you and I. So as we practice these habits, the Holy Spirit continues to nudge and move us toward a richer and more fulfilling life. And isn't that what Jesus wanted? In John chapter 10, verse 10, when he said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. To the full until it overflows. If that's your goal today, then can I encourage you to set these practices in place? Begin to practice them. And here's the thing. It's not going to be a quick fix. You're not going to have them down next week, Sunday. No, no, no. These are things you need to do consistently. And as we establish Grow College later this year, which you're going to hear about, um, and as we strengthen it, these are some of the things that we'll be working towards so that you can live a healthier and more holistic faith. Well, I hope that you are blessed by this. I hope that you are encouraged. I hope that this has meant something to you. But most of all, I hope that the Spirit leads you to apply these practices into your life because when you have these in place, everything else begins to be healthier. Your work, your relationship, your family, your career, your studies, everything else has a better foundation because you've got a strong rule of life. The stem of your life will be strengthened and it will be straight and upright as you grow higher towards God and as you grow in your spirituality. And so with that being said, may you be blessed. May this be a year of growth and blessing and favor. May God have his hand upon you and may everything you do be for the glory of God. Have a blessed day. Can't wait to see you next week as we open up for the first Sunday of 2022. Next week, come a little bit earlier. Our cafe will officially be open. We'll be serving some good, good cappuccinos and we're going to have an amazing time. See you next week. Yeah.